We are in a series called Cultural Distinctives, and an easy way to say that is what makes us us. Welcome to everyone that's watching online this morning. We're talking about what makes us us as a spiritual family. And we talked about our signature verse, the verse that our church is built upon, Luke 4.18, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free and to proclaim the year of the sovereign Lord's favor. God made it so clear that this was our calling when Jesus decided to define his ministry, at the beginning he goes into the temple in Nazareth, the synagogue in Nazareth, opens the scroll, the prophet Isaiah, and reads this scripture. And we knew that this was what God was calling us to as a church. And many of you have seen the famous, what we call the lightning bolt picture, where we said, this is our signature verse, and these are the five pillars, or the five callings we get out of this So Holy Spirit, empowered ministry of every believer, ministry to the poor, bold proclamation of the gospel, the healing of people's bodies, their minds, their hearts, and also the healing of the racial pain that's so prevalent in our country and our world. And lastly, the blessing of the body of Christ, the unity in the body of Christ. And this is what all people's church is all about. This is what your spiritual family is all about. We believe this is what Jesus is all about. And we believe this is what we're supposed to plant around the world as we send laborers everywhere around the earth. And As I was thinking about beginning to unpack this, I remembered back to my college years when I really started diving into the Bible. I I, I had grown up a Christian, but what I find is many Christians don't read the Bible. I I, I meet many Christians that have actually never read the whole Bible, and that's one of the challenges that we really give here. That's why we do the Bible in one year. We're always talking about that so that you would actually know this whole book. It's actually not hard to attain if you're in it daily, but as I started reading this, I started noticing what's in this book is very different than my Christian life and the the Christians around me. And I, I went on a journey of starting to go from church to church because as I would go to church, it was more like a religious thing. It was more like a one hour thing, or if you were super serious, you'd also go to a Wednesday night. And as I looked at the, the followers of Jesus in the Bible, and specifically the disciples in the Gospels and the church being birthed in the book of Acts, I thought it's very different. I mean, they had a passion about them. It was a, it was a daily lifestyle. And so I started looking for that, going for church to church, trying to find that. And it, it seemed like people were much more passionate about baseball or their hobbies or a good meal out to eat than they were about Jesus. And, and, and it really challenged me of, you know, is there a people living this daily life? And I remember hearing about this mission trip. I talk, I talk about it often, a mission trip to Mexico that a bunch of college students were going to from, from my local church. And they actually came back talking about people being saved. They even talked about miracles happening. And I'd been on a mission trip or two. We never saw a person saved We especially never saw miracles, and I I, I went to visit that church, and they weirded me out. Like, these people were emotional. Like, they actually raised their hands in worship, you know, and I came from the frozen chosen. Uh, Some people would cry during worship, you know, and I'd be like, what is wrong with you? People closed their eyes when they sang, you know, people only closed their eyes in my church when they were sleeping, and... Uh, they, they just were weird to me. But I, I signed up to go on this mission trip because I was just desperate to, to see what was happening in the Bible. And they were talking about seeing it. And the first thing I noticed about these people is they prayed. Like they really prayed. Now, I, I grew up in a church where we talked about prayer. Uh, we'd even get in a circle to pray. Typically, there was one person that prayed. And then how we'd, if you didn't want to pray, you'd stand in a circle and you'd squeeze the person's hand next to you. And you'd kind of like, next, next, next. And, and people, if they asked for prayer, a lot of times people, you know, were too embarrassed to even ask for prayer and be real. And so they'd say, 
have an unspoken? Uh, would you pray for my unspoken? You're like, what is an unspoken? Uh, but that, that, that was kind of the prayer culture we had. So when I got to this group that was planning on going to Mexico, and we started praying. And I don't, I don't know, uh, maybe you've had this experience showing up at this church where people started praying. And my prayers growing up were like, oh, Lord, thank you for this beautiful day. Thank you for the butterflies and the bunnies. And for, you know, that, you know and I'd maybe, Lord, would you bless me? And, and if it's your will, you know, maybe help this person. And those were my kind of prayers. And I got into this college group and people would lift their hands and they'd be, they'd pray like Lisa. Lord, we ask in Jesus' name that you'd rid the heavens and come down and transform it. You know, and you're like, oh, right? It was like the old... You remember the, in the movie theater, that old surround system where the, the speakers would go off and the hair on the person would be blown back? And they, people start praying, and I'd have like goosebumps on me, and I'd be, oh. It was kind of like Gandalf, you shall not pass. <laughs> like, what in the world <laughs> is going on here? And I started realizing, oh, maybe this is why they're seeing so many people saved. Then they didn't just pray. They fasted. They called a three-day fast of college students. I thought certainly that's illegal to ask young people to go without food. That certainly that is not moral to ask 18 to 22-year-old men to not eat. I ate like five times a day, um, and, and and they prayed. And then we get down to Mexico, and and everything. We're gonna get on the bus. We're gonna pray. We're going to get to the, the, the outreach, and in public, like in public places, they got together and prayed, and then they said, we're going to wait and listen to the Lord. <laughs> I thought, I'm going to be listening all day. I'll be waiting all day for God to say something. He hadn't said anything to me the last 19 years of my life, and, 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 and then they would report these different things that, that God had spoken to them, and then, you know, they, someone would say, this 18-year-old, I, I felt like God showed me this person wearing a Mickey Mouse shirt. I'm like, what are you talking about? And then up out of the crowd, a Mickey Mouse shirt person would come. They go share with him. They get saved, and I'm thinking, what is going on here? And uh, I've shared the story many times. I, I, I learned the little gospel track, and I'd go up to share with people, and, and I'd share the gospel, and no one would be saved. And then they asked us to pray for the sick, and, and people would raise their hands, and I'd go lay hands on people and pray and nothing, so I'd try harder. <laughs> be healed, you know, and nothing, you know. Then you get desperate. You start trying things in the Bible, spitting, <laughs> you know, on people and rubbing it on them. Nothing worked. And the pastor started talking about the power of the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit being on us, but that we have to be emptied and we have to be submitted to what he wants. And I'll never forget being on that back row. Many of you have heard the story. I'm so convicted because I realized that life's been all about me, about my image, about my desires, my dreams, my plans, my self-will, my self-strength. And he says, you know, if you really want the power of the Holy Spirit to be on you, the Bible says that it's about humbling yourself under the mighty right hand of God, and he'll lift you up. And so at the end of that service, I ran to the front, and I started repenting of my pride and repenting of image and repenting of all my sin and just saying, Holy Spirit, if you can use me, could you just do something? And a person came up, laid hands on me, and the power of God, I didn't even believe this could happen, started surging through me like lightning bolts. That had, I had no power. I had no grid for that in my traditional church background. And my body started shaking and trembling. And, and I just kind of was stuck to the ground for about 45 minutes. At the end of that time, we got up, went on an outreach that evening. And when I laid my hands on a sick person, I had done this now all week long to no avail but when I laid my hands on a sick person, a guy who with a, a hunched back, his back started snapping and popping and came back straight. His stomach started contorting until it subsided. He explained for 20 years he had been suffering of excruciating pain, and in an instant he was healed. He lifted his hands in the air, which up to that point had been offensive to me. He's crying, which up to that point had been offensive to me. But I can see 
He's so thankful that God broke into his life, that it changed my life right there. I started giving glory to God with him. And right after that, I went and I just started telling people on the streets about Jesus and what he did. And my first person that I'd ever led to the Lord came to Jesus right there. Then I went to the next and the next person came to the Lord. And then the next and the next, I went from having never led anybody to the Lord within 15 minutes, leading four people to the Lord. And I understood that what happened is the spirit of the sovereign Lord came on me and he anointed me to preach good news to the poor. And he sent me to heal the sick. And God has that for every believer that calls on the name of, the, of Jesus and seeks his face. And that's what we want to talk about tonight as we talk, or today and tonight and the rest of our life, by the way, as we talk about Spirit-empowered ministry or the Holy Spirit being on you. You know, this is the model of Jesus, is Jesus would go away and seek the Father. Jesus would go to a private place and pray. What he showed is that ministry came out of intimacy. If you're taking notes today, write that down. Your ministry will come out of your intimacy with the Father. Your ministry for God will come out of your intimacy with God. And so look at this, Mark chapter 1. It's absolutely amazing. It says, as soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they immediately told Jesus about her. So he went to her, took her hand, and helped her up. The fever left her, and she began to wait on, on them. I mean, that's one of the real upsides of healing ministry is people turn and serve you dinner. And that evening, after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. Did you hear that? He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. So oftentimes we think, well, Jesus is just God walking around on the earth, and that's why he can do what he did. But we talked about last week this understanding of Christology that actually Jesus, according to Philippians 2, came down to earth and emptied himself, and that's why he did no miracles until he actually got baptized, not just in water, but the Holy Spirit comes on him, and then boom, he moves out in the power of the Spirit. But then he shows this constant intake where he goes off alone with the Lord and receives more, and then outtake where he releases the power and the presence of God on hurting and broken humanity. And so after this great night of power, what does Jesus do? I've got to go alone and get with God and pray to my Father and receive from him. And that's how this next part happens where it says this, Simon and his companions went to look for him. And when they found him, they explained, everyone's looking for you. He's like, Jesus, why did you leave? We're finally seeing the kingdom come. We're finally having this healing revival. And Jesus says this interesting thing. He says, Jesus replied, let us go somewhere else. <laughs> what? Like, Jesus, it's finally happening. And Jesus goes, no, let's go somewhere else to a nearby village so I can preach there also. That's why I've come. You see, Jesus wasn't into making this, this big splash. No, Jesus just wanted to do the will and work of the Father. Oh, it's absolutely beautiful. And that's what we want to be as a people, that we want to live in communion with God. And that comes out of building an uh, intimate one-on-one -on -one life with God Almighty. You see this throughout his life. Jesus draws away. You remember he goes into the desert to, to pray, and then he comes out to do his ministry. You see all of a sudden these miracle ministries, and then Jesus draws away to pray. Then you see more ministry, and then Jesus teaches his disciples. Mark chapter 4, he says, Come away with me to a quiet and lonely place and get some rest. So many times we think, oh, I just need to go on vacation. Jesus said, go to a quiet place and get some rest. No, he says, come and get alone with me and get some rest. You see this before Jesus goes to the cross. He goes to the garden and he spends this time in prayer. This is the way of Jesus. But it wasn't just his way. It was the way of Peter and James and John. That The early disciples, they would get alone. It says on their way to the temple right after Pentecost, at the hour of prayer, they're going to spend an hour of prayer. You see Peter 
ministering and then out, up on the rooftop in Joppa, spending time with God. You see the same with Paul. These, these times are just getting away and spending time with God. I love these different quotes from some of our more modern Christian heroes. Corey Ten Boom, who hid numerous Jews. I got to go to, to, to her home in Amsterdam, and it's now a, a museum, and, and they had a prayer meeting. Their family had a prayer meeting that went on for generations, and this is what she said. Don't pray when you feel like it. Have an appointment with the Lord and keep it. A man is powerful on his knees. I want to ask you, do you have a daily appointment with the Lord? You have a father who wants to be with you every day. I like this from Charles Stanley. The amount of time we spend with Jesus meditating on his word and his majesty seeking his face establishes our fruitfulness in the kingdom. Or from A.W. Tozer, if a man wants to be used by God, he cannot spend all of his time with people. Oh, these are beautiful. But oftentimes we think, well, those are the Christian heroes. Those are preachers. Those are missionaries. But what about an ordinary person? I, I, I love the stories of different ones in our spiritual family who, who spend time with God. And, and God just does these amazing things. One of my friends, he's, he's real techie. He's, he's the guy that everyone calls to help them set up their computer or their home entertainment system. And, and so uh, another person had asked him to come and, and set up the entertainment system, and, and he actually got stumped. He, he didn't know what to do. And he said the next day, he's seeking the Lord in his morning devotional, and God shows him an image of of different wires that need to be wired a different way. He calls the guy, says, can I show back up at your house? Switches the wires and boom, it works. I call that name of God, Jehovah Techie. <laughs> right? He loves to be involved in our everyday life. Seen about a, 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 a guy that had uh, it, it doing a development, doing a, a real estate development, and in his prayer time, uh, started having like he's praying, and all of a sudden there's these just arguments that are that are coming that that people might say against him, and and then all of a sudden these rebuttals to these arguments, and the guy's kind of like, why why is that going on? Like why am I going through that? And then that evening in the community meeting, every single one of those arguments that came in the morning was brought, and he had the answers to share. You know, I call that Jehovah practical, right? God loves to be in our lives. Um, I, I love different ones of our, our mothers in our church, and they, they'll start having challenges with their little ones, and in their devotional time, in their face time, God starts giving them strategy for how to raise their kids and, and, and what to do with different children. Can I tell you that God has answers to every one of your problems? It's not just the spiritual realm. He wants to be involved in your marriage. He wants to be involved in your child raising. He wants to be involved in your workplace. And we access him by spending time with him. And so as long as I'm the pastor of this church, I will continue to say our greatest desire, if you get one thing from being with us, it's to have a daily FaceTime. I want to put this up yet again from our website because this is going to help you. We've put these practicals on the website, how to spend time with God. You, you see these discipleship lessons. Lesson number five, if you say, I don't know how to have a FaceTime. Like people told me growing up in church, you need to spend time with God, but I didn't know how to do it. Well, here is a practical. I wish someone would have given this to me. We've written it in lesson number five. Just go on the downloads and, and download that. Or here's a whole FaceTime packet that you can download. I have it right here that shows you how to do this. And, and, and it's going to teach you how to spend an hour with God. You're like, there's no way I could do that. No, when I was a college student, they taught us how to do this. 250 of us were spending an hour a day with God. It's actually not hard. And here's ways to worship and how to understand the character of God and how to pray and, and how to do the Acts model prayer, how to do the Lord's prayer. So I just want to take you for a moment 
into my FaceTime. I want to model it for you because no one modeled it for me. Now, you're going to understand that this isn't a real FaceTime. This is actually a fabrication because I don't have a cup of coffee. And in my authentic FaceTime, I always have a cup of coffee with me. Uh, but this is what I do. I start every day in the Word of God. You desperately need the Word of God. The more of the Word of God you get in your mind, the more peaceful you're going to be. The, the Bible says this, do not be conformed any longer to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Who wants a more peaceful, joyful mind? Well, here is the simple solution. Be daily in the Word of God. So as I get in the Word of God, I don't read it like a textbook. I don't, you know, start in, in uh, Luke chapter 4 and just go, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan, led the Spirit in the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil, he ate nothing. Done. Boom. And move on. No, you want to chew. You want to chew the cud like a big, fat, contented cow. <clears throat> Have you ever seen a cow chewing because they chew it, chew it, chew it. Then they swallow it. And then they, they throw it up in their mouth and regurgitate it. You need to regurgitate the Word of God. This is what I do. I ask three questions when I'm reading the Word of God. Who is God? And I actually, so I'm reading this. And it says, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led into the spirit of wilderness. Well, who is God? It's Jesus. And he's the Holy Spirit. And then I'm asking this question, who am I? You know, the world's trying to tell you all different things about who you are, but only God knows the true answer. And you need your identity rooted and established in him. And so I, I keep reading the Word of God until I find more about me. And, and, and so I'm, I'm reading this. The devil said to him, if you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Jesus answered, it's written, man shall not live on bread alone. Oh, who am I? I'm a person who doesn't just live on bread, who don't live on bread. And I'm like, okay, I'm not just, it's not just about what I eat. It's actually about the Word of God. And then the last thing is how do I respond or how do I obey? And so I'm immediately looking at this and going, man, I need the Word of God. I, I want to challenge you. Write. Journal while you read the Word of God. Studies show that you remember 80% of, uh, well, you remember about 40 to 60% of what you write down. You remember 80% of what you teach. But I challenge you to write down as you read the Word of God. It helps focus your mind. You know, a lot of times you can be reading and you can be thinking about two things at once, but if you start writing, you can only be thinking about one thing. It focuses your mind. And find out who is God. What you think about God is the most important thing in your whole life. What you believe about you will set the course of your life. And if you start deciding to obey God, you become a kingdom agent that transforms society. So I do that every day when I'm reading the Word of God. The next thing I do is I move into a prayer time. Now, Jesus' disciple one time came to him, Luke 11, and says, Lord, because they're seeing this lifestyle of Jesus, and they're going, wow, he's always praying. And they, like all of us, were like, man, I stink at prayer. Lord, teach us to pray. And so Jesus gives them this model in Luke chapter 11. It says, one day when Jesus was praying in a certain place, when he finished, one of his disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. He said to them, when you pray, say, Father. Oh, I love that. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us and lead us into temptation. Now, some of the church around the world took that to say, let us pray. Our Father, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. We become like spiritual zombies. I don't think that's what he was going for. Now, let me just tell you, I think it's better to say that than nothing, but I actually believe that each one of these is 
a portal to God's presence. I believe each one of these is a sub headline for us to access God with a different tool. So let me explain this. Our Father, I call this sonship prayer. I come to God and I relate to him as a father and I thank him for adopting me and I thank him for touching me. This is where I'm really thanking God for what he has done for me as a father and I come into his presence as his son. That's how I always start. I relate to him as my daddy. So I spend some time doing that until I'm experiencing his presence and feeling his love. And then I go to this next part, hallowed. Hallowed be thy name. What is this? This is worship. Okay. Man, we live in a great day of worship. I mean, wow. I... I, Growing up in church, and I'm so thankful that I grew up in church, and I'm not trying to denigrate it, but man, I couldn't even understand the words of the songs that we were singing. We sang about him being a bulwark, never failing. I'm like, what the heck is a bulwark? Now we sing songs that I actually understand, and, and, and I, 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 I experience the presence of God. So I, I find songs that are touching my heart. Find things that stir your heart with fire, and then also I I go through and I actually declare out loud who God is. I take what I've read in the Bible. I thank you that you are the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings. You're the Lion of the tribe of Judah. You're the Rose of Sharon. You are the, 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 the Lord of the angel armies. You are the Alpha and Omega. You're the beginning and end. Oftentimes I'll do the alphabet of praise, but what I'm trying to do is I'm just trying to worship him. Worship him whether you feel like it or not. Press it. He is worthy every day for you to worship. So I worship him. And then I move to the next part. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. This is amazing. God has chosen you to partner with him in intercession. This is where we pray for his kingdom to come on earth. This is where every day I pray for you. I pray for our church. I pray that our five D's would happen, that people would make decisions, that they'd get dunked, they'd get baptized, that they'd get delivered in our freedom days and, and through healing prayer, that they get discipled, that they get deployed. I'm praying this. I'm praying for my staff every day. I'm praying that they would be full of the Holy Spirit and full of faith and have kingdom strategies. I'm praying for our church plants. I pray for all people's Tijuana. I pray for all people's Stellenbosch. I pray for all people's Moldova. I pray for all people's Bali. I pray for all people's in the Middle East. I pray for our future church plans. I pray for all people's Paris. I pray for all people's Oaxaca. I'm praying for all people's Peru. I'm pray this is where we're advancing the kingdom, right? So you, you pray for God's kingdom to come and, and, and just watch yourself get swept into a divine current of grace. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. This is where I pray for what little Robbie wants, right? Most of the time, that's all people pray, but you see how, how, how I've, I've already entered into what God cares about before me. Give this our daily bread. This is what we call supplication. And if you're like, what is supplication? You can just write down asking. So this is where I start asking for the things we need. I start praying for, for Stephanie, my wife, to be blessed, to be built up, to have strength and energy, to put up with me. I pray, I pray for my, my, my kids, and I, I'm praying for them to, to be met by the Lord. I have verses. I have my son Hudson. I have a, 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 a verse. One thing I ask of the Lord, this is what I seek, that I might dwell in the courts of the Lord. This is Psalm 27 over Hudson, Psalm 84 over Halley, Acts 11 over John Mark. These are the verses I'm praying. I'm praying for them to meet with God. I'm, I'm, I'm praying over my family. I'm praying for our financial needs. Have you ever noticed that you always have a financial need? I have, I actually know some really rich people and they always have financial needs. I, could it be that God lets us have needs so that we stay dependent on him? And this is where I bring it to him. And the amazing thing is God answers. And you know what happens when God answers? Then he gets the glory. Oh, what a joy to bring our needs before 
the Lord. Forgive us. Oh, man. Make sure you get good at repentance. Every day I, I, I confess, because you know what? Every day I end up sinning. Every day there's things that I've done that I just, I, I know that, that I've, I've broken God's heart. So I forgive us our sins and as we forgive those who trespass against us. And I'm letting people go every day. Sometimes I'm like, Lord, I forgave that person yesterday. Are you serious? I need to bring that up again. He's like, yes, because I want you to have a clean heart. I want you to walk unencumbered. I don't want you to have that weight of unforgiveness. And then the last thing is lead us not, lead not into temptation. And this is protection prayer. I remember one time I was like, does this stuff really work? Does protection prayer really work? I was walking in the mountains of New Mexico doing this protection prayer. And I, I, and I just, have you ever been praying and all of a sudden you're hit with unbelief? Yeah. Let me just be honest with you. I'm a pastor. I, live, I preach this stuff. And I'm like, does it really work to pray the blood of Jesus? Like, is that some weird hocus pocus spell and it's really and I'm and I go you know what I just need to do it anyway Lord protect me Lord I plead the blood of Jesus over me and my family and <laughs> from here to the podium the bush next to me starts shaking and out pops a mountain lion and runs the other way you know what I said hallelujah <laughs> I go it works Lord I for I forgive me for ever asking <laughs> if this stuff works you just saved me. <laughs> that mountain lion was just waiting for me, and I, I, I think it hurt the blood of Jesus, and it went, I'm out of here. <laughs> pray protection. Pray protection from temptation. Man, pray over your family and your friends and, and yourself. And then the last thing I do is I listen to the Lord. You know, I, I, I hear God speaking over me his love for me. Uh, God, God, God has given me a couple of spiritual names that just mean the world to me, that it's between me and him. Uh, a lot of times, God will just be Jehovah practical with me. Robert, you haven't paid this bill. That'll pop into my mind at the end of my prayer time. I, I've, I've been saved from more administrative blunders because I spent time with God than anything else, better than any checklist. Now, I do write it down on the list during my prayer time when it comes to mind. But listen to God and watch him orchestrate your life. Now, how, how I learned to pray, though, was through this. Now, let, let, me, let, me, uh, let me go into this next verse. Then Jesus said to him, suppose you have a friend and you go to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me and I have no food for him. And suppose the one inside answers, don't bother me. The door is already locked and my children and I are in bed and I can't get up and give you anything. This is so crazy because Jesus is talking about prayer. And so oftentimes, especially in the American church, we're all about, you know, it's just, he's a friend and our friends are nice. And Jesus is saying, Hey, this is how God is. He's actually not going to give you bread just because you're a friend. You're like, what? Watch this next thing. And suppose this friend inside says, don't bother me. The door's already locked and my children are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything, huh? I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of your friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, say shameless, shameless. Audacity. audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. I really learned how to pray personally by praying corporately. And that's why we have things like prayer week. So we, we have these three different events this coming week. So on Wednesday night, we have our Rosh Hashanah corporate beginning of the spiritual Jewish year prayer. And this is just happens to fall on our monthly. Every month we bring all the life groups together and we pack out this tent. Please be here. This is what your church is doing is we're having this prayer time and we contend for things. We've built this church on prayer. I'll never forget when we were trying to launch our public services at Horace Mann Middle School, there were about 20 of us and we had no money, like zero money. No 
one had a real job. Uh, and, and, and yet we knew we were supposed to be in Horace Mann Middle School. It was confirmed to us, and we needed $10,000 to start that next week. And let me just tell you, we had nothing. And so we started praying. We started contending, oh, Lord, you've called us to open public services. You call us, Lord, certainly you can provide $10,000. That week, one of our church planting young women was at coffee with another friend, and they were talking about our church and talking about that, that we're planting a church. And this older man comes over and he says, I know this is so awkward. I promise I wasn't eavesdropping, but I kind of was. And I heard that y'all are starting a church, and I just wonder, is there anything I can do to help you? And she goes, well, I'm not sure. Let me give you our pastor's number. So this guy calls me, and he goes, is there anything that you need? And I went, uh, um, yeah, we need $10,000. And there was a check in the mail by the end of the week, and we started the church like that. Come on. God can bring an answer from anywhere, but he's asking us to petition heaven so we can partner with him and see his miraculous hand. I remember when we felt led to have church on San Diego State. Some of you were with us. The problem is San Diego State said we couldn't have church there, but we knew that we were called to be there. So what did we do? We gathered the whole church in one of our Wednesday night prayer meetings, and we started praying. And I'll never forget Hudson, our, our young adults pastor, said like, dude, that is crazy because what if it doesn't happen? Like we've just rallied the whole church to pray for something. I said, well, if it doesn't happen, it's going to happen. <laughs> and so we got together and we cried out and we, we went from one meeting of them saying, you can't do it to the next meeting of them saying, you know what? Yeah, we can do this. Hallelujah. We were on campus. I remember when we couldn't find a place, two years we're looking for a place to buy. And they said, nothing exists. And I remember the time where Kendall says, okay, every corporate prayer meeting, we've got to ask God, give us a permanent home, give us land. Uh, the, the realtor said nothing existed, but boom, a breakthrough. And we got something exceedingly and abundantly more than we would have asked or hope for. And let me tell you, we still need to be petitioning heaven because there is a fight to have land and to have a permanent home as a church in our city. Why? Because God wants to establish the kingdom and the enemy wants to block it. We've got to be a people of prayer. I spent this last Friday in a miserable way. Uh, we're, we're doing a little house renovation and we're putting a, a, a bathroom in our garage. The problem is the garage has a concrete floor and then we have to run it outside to a pipe. The problem is the pipe has to go through our foundation. So I spent from 8 a.m. to 3.30 p.m. jackhammering. I am a preacher. I am good with books. I might even be good at telling jokes, but I am not good at jackhammering. And I don't know if you've ever been doing physical work when halfway through, you're like, I am going to die. <laughs> like, I can't, like, I actually can't do this. You, you, you start thinking like someone, I would rather someone come and strike me down right now. Like, I am, I am not going to survive. I am jackhammering and I am hitting the ground and I'm like, I'm going to dislodge my pupils. Like, I'm shaking so bad that my eyes are like, I, I really started, like, getting concerned that the little black parts of my eyes were going to, like, dislodge from the rest. It was that bad. And that is sometimes how you feel when you are in intercession prayer. When we're in corporate prayer, we have this unmovable, concrete barrier mountain, and you come up, and you're putting down the jackhammer, and you're just bouncing. You're like, uh, 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 and you want to quit. And you're just shaking, and you're like, I cannot hold on any longer. But you know what happens? All of a sudden, there's this moment when you're jackhammering that against just a solid floor that a fissure happens. Like this little, it finally cracks. Now, let me tell you, you could take your hand, and I could hit this asphalt the rest of the day, and there would be no fissure. But you take the jackhammer, you take the tool of intercessory prayer, and you hit it, and yeah, for a while, you just, it's going to kill me, and then boom, a fissure. And then, you know what happens next? Then next, that jackhammer pierces through that fissure, and you start feeling something. You're like, oh, what's going on? And then the next thing, 
boom, a block of concrete just gets dislodged and you've destroyed this stronghold. And that's why God made me jackhammer for eight hours. So I could tell you that you're not going to die. Keep praying. Keep pressing in. Although the situation seems impossible, hold on because eventually you're going to have that little fissure and then eventually it's going to break through. And then eventually, boom, you've got the supernatural breakthrough. And that's the only way. That's the only way we're going to see revival hit our city. It's the only way we're going to see thousands of churches planted. It's the only way where we're going to see racial reconciliation truly happen, where everyone feels a part of the family. Everyone feels in love. Everyone feels empowered to do the will and work of the ministry. It's the only way we're going to see a culture where people with mental illness come in and actually get transformed. It's the only way where prodigal children are going to come back to the Lord. It's the only way. It's through that jackhammer of consistent prayer. We keep going. We keep going. Could it be? I was talking to a pastor this week, and man, the, 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 the COVID's just been tearing through in, in, in their state, and, and the, the churches are closed, and, and so many people sick. And he said, so how's it going in, in your church? And I said, man, it's like so few, and, and, and the churches of San Diego are, 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 are starting to open, and, and, and our schools are, are starting to open, and they're like, really? And they said, well, what do you attribute it to? And I said, I mean, I'm not 100% sure, but I will tell you that 136 churches got together, and 15,000 people went out on the street for a solid hour to pray for the protection and blessing of our city. Could that be why San Diego has been so sheltered, why the churches are flourishing, why there's so much unity in the church, why there's so many people coming to Christ right now. We probably had 40 to 50 people saved in the last seven weeks. Could it be because the church came together and jackhammered on the same city and said, we're going to see a breakthrough and boom, it's opened up. Because scripture says, so I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be open for everyone who asks, receives, and the one who seeks, finds, and the one who knocks, the door will be open. So I just want to encourage you this Wednesday night, come in, join us as we pray for breakthrough in our personal lives, in our family's lives, in our church life. Saturday, we're doing it again. We're going to have We Pray San Diego, part two. This time, we're going to meet in the tent, pray for 30 minutes, and then we're going to go to our schools because we want to see a revival of our young people. We're going to be on Crawford, Horseman. We're going to be on state campus. We're going to be on these different schools where we're praying for protection. Our students need a revival. Next week, now, our college students are fasting this week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. I'm so proud of them. Next week, I encourage you, our, our larger Antioch family, that larger movement we're a part of is going to go on a three-day fast, the 28th, 29th, and 30th, praying for our international workers. Would you jump in a meal or a day and pray for one of our church plants? Pray for some of our missionaries. They need the power of God. They actually say, I saw a newsletter. I'll end with this. I saw a newsletter from one of our workers who said, we asked for more prayer. We sent it out, and they started chronicling about six answers to prayer in the people they're reaching out to because of specific prayer. Can I tell you that prayer changes things? Let's be a people of prayer and we will see the kingdom of God advance. Let's stand up.